This video was made possible thanks to CuriosityStream. Watch TLDR ad-free and get exclusive videos from us by signing up to the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle deal at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDR EU. So on Thursday morning, Putin announced that the Russian army would be invading Ukraine in order to topple President Zelensky's government, which Putin described as an illegitimate junta. Soon after, Russian crews and ballistic missiles landed near Kiev and as far west as ivano franjusk So in this video, we're going to do our best to explain what's happened, what might happen next and what it means for Europe. Before we get into that though, we should say that events are unfolding at a rapid pace. This video was primarily written on Thursday morning and verifiable reports are hard to come by. We'll qualify our reports where possible, but please bear in mind the information presented here is subject to change. Also, if you want to support those on the ground, there's a list of charities on screen which you could consider supporting. So let's start with a timeline of the last 48 hours or so. The first relevant event came on Tuesday evening, when Putin confirmed that Russia would indeed be recognising the proclaimed borders of the self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. You might know this already, but separatists only actually hold about a third of the areas they're claiming, with the rest still within the Ukrainian government's control. As we explained in our previous video, this didn't bode well, as it meant that Russian forces would end up fighting against Ukrainian security forces in those last parts of Donbass not yet controlled by separatists. On Wednesday at about 4pm, Ukraine's ministries of defence, foreign affairs and internal affairs, as well as two private banks, suffered simultaneous cyber attacks. And soon after, on Wednesday evening, the Ukrainian president declared a state of emergency, imposing martial law. Some 36,000 reservists with combat experience were then called up to add to Ukraine's 200,000 strong army. Late on Wednesday evening, the self-proclaimed republics of Donetsk and Luhansk asked the Russian military for assistance to, quote, repel the aggression of the Ukrainian regime. Previously, when Russia had first recognised the territories, they'd insisted that they were self-reliant, and wouldn't need Russian support, something that was clearly already changing. Obviously anticipating war, at 3am, Ukraine's President Zelensky gave a speech pleading with the Russian people to prevent a full-blown conflict between the two countries. Speaking in Russian, Zelensky asked the Russian people not to trust the narrative propagated by the Russian state media, as well as rubbishing Putin's claims about rampant Nazism in Ukraine pointing out that he himself was Jewish. Zelensky also insisted that Ukrainians only want peace, and denied that Ukraine had fired artillery on Donbass, but warning that if Putin did attack, then you would see our faces, not our backs. Then at 5am local time, Putin gave an emergency broadcast on Russian state television. Much like his speech on Monday night, Putin's speech was long-winded, somewhat rambling, and full of history. In the 35-minute speech, Putin made reference to Yugoslavia, Libya, Syria and Iraq, as well as claiming that the West's anti-Russian containment strategy represented an existential threat, and accused the West of trying to destroy Russian culture and project, quote, pseudo-values contrary to human nature, describing the Western bloc as a, quote, empire of lies, and blaming the West for fomenting terrorism abroad. Putin then said that he'd decided to conduct a special military operation, not just in Donbass, but in the rest of the Ukraine, in order to, quote, demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Putin then invoked Article 51 of the UN Charter, which allows for collective self-defense, effectively claiming that the phantom threat of a Ukrainian attempt to take back Donetsk and Luhansk was a threat to Russia's own national security. Putin then asked the Ukrainian military to lay down their weapons, insisting that his issue wasn't with the Ukrainian people, but rather with the junta in Kiev, and quote, those who have taken Ukraine hostage and tried to use it as a proxy. Putin's description of Zelensk's government as a junta harks back to an argument made by Russia after the May 2014 election, when Russian officials claimed that the president was illegitimate because Donbass didn't get to vote. Essentially, Putin's argument here is that the current government in Kiev is illegitimate because Donbass didn't get a say in it, 
which is how he's justified intervention in the rest of Ukraine beyond Donbass. Obviously though, Donbass didn't get to vote because they were fighting a low intensity war with Ukraine's own security forces at the time. A war that was actually backed by Russia, so the government deemed that voting wouldn't be possible in the region. And it's also worth reminding everyone that regardless, Zelensky won with 73% of the vote back in 2019. Facts that Putin conveniently omits. Anyway, you get the point. Putin basically announced that Russia would be staging a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Almost immediately afterwards, there were reports of missile strikes throughout Ukraine, including airfields, military headquarters, and military warehouses near Kiev. As the first explosions were being reported, the UN Security Council was holding an emergency session, chaired by Russia itself, who currently holds the rotating presidency. This meeting began with a direct appeal from the UN Secretary General, with him saying, President Putin, stop your troops from attacking Ukraine. Give peace a chance. Too many people have died already. Now, we should remind you here that everything is moving very fast at the moment, and verifiable reports of troop movements are hard to come by. But as of Thursday, it looks like Russian troops have staged offences on four fronts. From Gomel and Belgorod in the north, Donbass in the east, and Crimea in the south. According to reports, Russian troops have already taken Hostomol, a town just outside of Kiev. And there are reports that airborne troops have just taken Ukraine's main airport, the airport near Kiev, although we couldn't verify this information at the time of the video's production. Two Turkish Airbus planes arrived at the airport just before the invasion, and just after Putin had a call with Erdogan, so it's possible that they're stationed there to provide a neutral, safe passage for Zelensky if he decides to leave the country. But that aside, what happens next? Well, so far, Russian airstrikes have apparently avoided civilian centres, and casualties have been limited, but this will probably change. For starters, airstrikes will invariably have collateral damage. Russia engaged in a similar artillery campaign against military targets in Mariupol in 2015, but wayward strikes ended up killing 30 civilians. Secondly, casualties have been limited because Ukrainian forces have spent the last few hours retreating into urban areas, but once Russian forces reach these hotspots, casualties will probably increase. As for the international response, well, the West is preparing for historic sanctions, but sanctions alone are unlikely to deter Putin, as we discussed in our recent video on the effectiveness of sanctions linked down below. Regardless, Russia has built up foreign currency reserves of $630 billion, a 75% increase since 2015, and now has the fourth largest currency reserve in the world, despite only being the 11th largest economy. And the West is expected to continue buying Russian oil and gas to the tune of about $700 million a day so there's no signs of this slowing. To get to this point, to have so much foreign currency, Putin has had to seriously cut back state spending, but it seemingly worked. Russia now only needs to sell oil at $44 a barrel to balance its budget. And for context, Brent crude is currently trading at over $100. The point is that Putin has deep pockets, and if he can continue to sell Russian oil and gas, those pockets will only get deeper. You get the point. Given Putin's behaviour and the state of Russia's oil reserves, sanctions are unlikely to provide much deterrence. So what's the strategy, military or otherwise, from here? Europe's currently without a clear political leader, and while attempts have been made to change Russia's path, nothing is certain just yet. In fact, this is a broader issue for the continent. Who's Europe's leader at tricky times like this? Is it EU bigwigs like von der Leyen and Michel? Is it long-time leaders like Rutter? Or, with Merkel gone, will Schultz take charge? But we discuss this exact issue, who's in charge of Europe, in our latest exclusive Nebula Plus video. You might have heard of them before, but my creator friends and I have teamed up to build our own platform where we don't need to worry about demonetization or the algorithm. Over there, you can find all of our latest videos ad-free, and we're also starting to post exclusive Nebula Plus videos over there as well, with our first one already live. It's not just us either. 
All of our favourite educational creators are there too, like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, Half as Interesting, and many more. But wait, we said this video was brought to you by CuriosityStream, right? Well, as a platform full of the best documentaries available online, they naturally love educational creators like us. And as such, we've worked out a deal whereby if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description, you'll also get access to Nebula for free. That's not a trial either, you'll have access for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. To make things even better, for a limited time they're offering a deal where you can get 26% off their already low price, making an entire year of both services less than $15. $15 for all of your favourite educational creators, as well as superb documentaries on CuriosityStream. Signing up at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDREU or clicking the link below not only gets you the deal, but it also directly supports TLDR and other educational content creators on the platform, as well as getting your original content and an ad-free experience.